I'm going to call a couple of audibles today. I think I fixed the slides as best as possible, but if uh, I didn't, it's not their fault back there, I promise. Uh, it's been a long week. This sermon came together about 8.30 this morning, so um, let's see how it goes, right? God is faithful. I want to start by reading one verse as our scripture reading for today. This is Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear dull, that it cannot hear. And what we say together after the reading of the word is this, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. It's not a fancy introduction, but I'm going to read the verse again. I want you to hear it. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. Last week, Pastor Danny shared with us that, that the Bible, the Word of God, points us to Jesus. What a blessing that truth is. That for us, in many of our stories, there were friends and family that pointed us to Jesus. Some of us have that to be deeply thankful for. And that most importantly of all, God supernaturally opens our eyes to see Jesus. See, that's good news for us, and that's beautiful for us, because the primary weight of seeing people trust Jesus was what he was talking about last week. The primary weight of that is not on my shoulders or your shoulders. It's God who does that work primarily. And that's really good news for us because Jesus can save anybody. His hand is not shortened that he cannot save. The ear is not dull that he, he cannot hear. What we're going to see today is that Jesus is a God of the impossible, who can pull off impossible things. And yes, we're in a sermon series that's kind of talking about us uh, praying for people to trust Jesus. So that is one of the primary applications of that. God can save anybody. Jesus can save anybody. But I want us to hear beyond that to, today, or in addition to that today, for whatever is going on in our lives today that seems impossible, whatever seems too difficult, whatever seems too big, too much, that Jesus can do anything. He wants to believe it a little more at the end of today than we did maybe coming in here. I pray that that's God's grace upon our, our lives today. So, Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Faith in Jesus for the impossible. We're going to see an impossible situation. This is John chapter 6, first seven verses. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He'd been in Jerusalem. He'd actually made a little bit of a stir up while he was there. He'd healed a man on the Sabbath day by the pool there in Jerusalem. The guy had been waiting to be healed for a long, long time. Jesus shows up and does it on the Sabbath day because Jesus doesn't give a rip about tradition. He gives a rip about fulfilling what the Old Testament had promised. It was a prophet who would roll in and do the impossible. Not only that, but then he Claims to be equal with God. That didn't go over very big either, you can imagine. I'm the Messiah. I'm equal with God. Pharisees and the scribes had a little problem with that. Things aren't going super well on the popularity tour for Jesus with the religious people. But they're going pretty good with the broken and the weak and the hurting and the people on the fringes. So he leaves. That's what he's going out of. He's leaving Jerusalem. He, he went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. No small trip, by the way. That, that Depending on where you're at, it can be anywhere from 7 to 13 miles wide. So they take a boat across. We read in another place, across the Sea of Galilee, which is the, the Sea of Tiberias. It had two names, just so keep everybody straight. And a large crowd was following him. So the broken, the hurting, the weak, people on the margins, they want more from Jesus. So the boat goes across, and they all circle around and see a galley, and by the time he gets across, he's got a welcome 
committee there. Jesus went up a mountain, though, when he first gets there. This is interesting, or, or on some part of the, the journey, and, and he sat down with his disciples. It doesn't last very long. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand, lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd that was coming toward him. Right, So here come the people. It's over 5,000, of, well over 5,000 of them. We'll, we'll find out here in a second. Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Stop for a second, by the way, in the midst of your impossible situation today. Don't forget that Jesus is sovereign. His timing might not be what you want it to be. But that doesn't mean he's clueless. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He knows exactly where your rescue is going to come from. He knows exactly where your portion is going to come from. He knows exactly where your healing is going to come from. He knows exactly how he's going to put all the pieces back together. He's not clueless, not even close. Every single detail he knows. But... In this case, this impossible situation, he's going to give Philip and others a chance to participate in the a solution to the impossible situation. How great of God to do that for us. He gives us an opportunity to be a part of it. Philip answered him, he doesn't have the solution, by the way. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Maybe that's what they had collected. Judas, the money guy, maybe, he, maybe they counted it. We got 200 denarii. That's about a day's worth of wages. It's not enough to even begin to feel. They not even get crumbs with that amount. They're in an impossible situation. If you look at Mark's account of this, and I did not. This is, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Corey, I'm sorry. Thank you for your faithfulness, but uh, I'm wild today. This is Mark's account. Of the same story. The apostles returned to Jesus and, and told him what they had done and taught. And, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place to rest a while. Don't miss that, by the way. They're not going to get to do much resting on this occasion. But Jesus does value that. Sometimes you got, this is free. This, this, I don't know what I'm doing. Some, uh, sometimes you got to put your phone down, turn the TV off, take a nap, Read the Bible, sit in the presence of God. It is not a sin to slow down. In fact, sometimes that's the best, most righteous thing you can do. So he says, let's go and let's rest in a desolate place. It's desolate there. For, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place, don't miss that, by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. Oh, it's Jesus and his, and his guys. And they ran there on foot. They kind of did like the Google Maps predictive, you know, like destination, whatever. And they, they get there and, and they're ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And just like Jesus, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't know where they were going. I can relate. I always know where I'm going. I need a shepherd, and, and he was there, and he began to teach them many things. But then it grew late, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. There ain't nothing here. No McDonald's, right? No Panera bread. We got nothing. This is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away. So they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? I, I read that one because I want you to realize it was a desolate place. Maybe you yourself are right now in a desolate place. This situation is impossible. Bob Dylan sings a song that says, it ain't dark yet. But it's getting there. Dusk is, on, is upon us. It ain't dark yet, but it's getting there. And it's desolate and there ain't a thing. 
and you feel it. It's an impossible situation. That's where they were in an impossible situation. What seems hopeless for you right now? Think about it. What seems too difficult right now? What seems impossible right now? Or to the sharing our faith piece of the series we're going through, who seems impossible right now? Who's somebody that you would think of, man, I would love it if they followed Jesus, but there ain't no way. What seems impossible right now? Who seems impossible right now? Don't miss verse 6. Here it has an invitation, by the way, of uh, Philip and others to do- join Jesus in doing the impossible. I already mentioned that, but I just don't want you to miss it. He's inviting Philip and them to be a part of it. And, and Andrew's the one that, that shows up. Andrew shows up with a mustard seed worth of faith. And that's about all he's going to need. Andrew shows up with a mustard seed worth of faith and a little boy with, with some true generosity. One of his disciples, this is verse 8, Andrew Simon Peter's brother said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Can you see it? That little mustard seed worth of faith. If he didn't have a mustard seed worth of faith, he'd have been like, Ah, we don't need your lunchable, sorry. And just moved on. Like, I like to imagine, Andrew, this is my imagination, but I like to imagine him, he sees the boy in his lunchable, and he, like, gets filled with some excitement. Jesus can do something with this. <laughs> Come on, we got to get your, you and your lunchable to Jesus. And as they start going, right, he's got some childlike faith at the start, but his adult realism starts to kind of kick in. And he starts to think, man, I'm going to kind of look like a fool when I get up here, the disciples... Especially Peter, my brother, man. (laughs) He's going to make fun of me, probably. Maybe maybe Jesus will even see this. It's foolish. Which is why you hear that hesitancy in his voice. He says, here's this boy, five loaves of bread, two fish. But what are they among so many? He says, I know it's impossible. Here's what what I have. Listen, Jesus isn't asking for perfect faith. And from the boy's perspective, he ain't asking for a massive donation. A little bit of faith. A little bit of of generosity. A mustard seed of faith. A lunchable worth of generosity. I'm going to show you the, the person in Scripture I relate to the absolute most. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Jesus and Peter and John have all gone up onto this hill. And on the top of that hill, uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of Jesus has been revealed to Peter and John while Moses and Elijah just magically appear too. It's like this wild scene where Peter and John get to see the, the sheer glory of the raw glory of Jesus. But when they come back down the hill from the Mount of Transfiguration, here's the scene they encounter. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, Jesus did, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, kind of raises his hand, teacher, Here's this situation. I brought my son to you. You were on the mountain, though. He has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples. Again, you were on the mountain, Jesus. We couldn't find you. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Possible situation. And he answered them, this is Jesus, and I don't know how you hear this, because it can sound like he's kind of 
kind of critiquing them, and he is a little bit, but if you're going to default to hearing something in Jesus' voice, I think the Bible's clear. It should be compassion every time. If you don't know how to read his tone, read it in compa- as compassion. He says, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Now hear me, that's Jesus saying, yes, he's critiquing their faith, but he's also longing for them to have faith. There's a longing in his heart that they would see the truth, that they would know the truth, that they would believe the truth. How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It's been impossible for a long time. It's not just been impossible one evening, nobody has food, bunch of people. It's been impossible day after day after day after day from, from childhood. And it often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. It's trying to take my son's life. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can. If you, if you can, you've come to the right place, but you don't even know you've come to the right place. All things are possible for the one who believes. Here's my guy. This is me. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. But then watch what he says. Help my unbelief. I don't relate to anybody in Scripture more than that guy. I believe, maybe this much, you got to help my own belief. Give me faith to believe. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said he is dead, but Jesus. <laughs> it's two good words right there. Took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. A mustard seed of faith is enough. I believe about this much, Father. Please help my unbelief. I believe about this much, Jesus. Help my unbelief. The coexistence of faith and doubt. Get used to that. We're human. Coexistence of faith and doubt. Back to the mountain with the 5,000 people. More important than the size of your faith is the object of your faith. More important than the size of your faith is the object of your faith. You see, Andrew's not going to be the hero of the story. That little boy's not going to be the hero of the story. Now, they got some things to teach us. Andrew's this invitation guy. You remember last week in the, in the foreground of that story that Danny told us from Scripture, Andrew's the one that invites Simon Peter, his brother, to Jesus. Andrew's known by many as the inviting apostle because he's always inviting people to Jesus. Peter, the rock, 3,000 people will be saved on day of Pentecost, as he preaches the gospel, he's not there if Andrew doesn't invite him. So he's worthy of being honored for that. Some Greek folks are looking for Jesus, Gentiles, outside of the Jewish faith at one point in Scripture. And and they go to Andrew and say, what do we do? Do we bring them to Jesus? Andrew's inviting people to Jesus. He's doing the same here with that boy. He's bringing him to Jesus. That doesn't make Andrew the, the hero. Worth imitating, but not the hero. The boy isn't the hero. He gave everything he had. Everything. You remember uh, Jesus is kind of like at the temple and all the Pharisees and the scribes are rolling in with their hundred dollar bills, you know. And they're like making it rain. And that little old lady comes up there with two little pennies. She puts them in. And everybody's like, whatever. And Jesus is like, stop. Did you see what just happened? 
breathtaking. And everybody's like, that's two pennies. What are we going to do with two pennies? He says, it's not the point. These guys go home like Scrooge McDuck. They got a pool full of money. She put in everything she has. So this boy does. He's hungry too. His stomach's growling too. He says, here you go. Five loaves of bread, two fish, you can have it. Good. Let's be those kinds of people. But you know why those kinds of people aren't the hero? Because they're just conduits to show the power of Jesus. It's Jesus who shows up. It's Jesus who makes the difference. Watch what Jesus does, verses 10 through 13. Jesus said, have the people sit down. I've got this little, he's holding this little Lunchable. It's kind of comedic if you think about it, quite frankly. But give him like a little Lunchable. He holds it in his hands. He's like, all right, we got this. <laughs> right? Everybody's like, what? We got what? Everybody sit down, right? Get his little scalpel out and like, you know, get 5,000 pieces of... Everybody sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Remember, we got kids and uh, wives and women here, too, so you get probably like 10,000 people, be more reasonable. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, don't miss this sentence, as much as they wanted. (laughs) Not like a little bit, like we're going to ration this, right, to make as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill. Hear me. Uh, Golden Corral is is a thorn in my side. My kids were introduced to it by my parents who graced us with their presence here today. Um, So they're going to just have to hear uh, about it. But uh, they tell me Ezra, our middle son, he's at Golden Corral yesterday. Anytime we go out of town, it's like the Golden Corral. It's like the it's like the mecca, right? For my kids, they love it. I mean, they love it, love it. <laughs> Ezra ate four pieces of steak. Is that <laughs> and like a piece of chicken? Like what? Have you ever your kid eats so much food that their belly gets tight? Your parents understand, right? And that's where they were. They ate their fill not done yet. The story's not over. And when they'd eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Jesus took a lunchable and he fed a multitude. That really happened, by the way. Maybe you grew up with the flannel graph lesson. And so the story is just really one-dimensional to you. It's kind of hard to recognize it as reality. In real life, flesh and blood, that happened. Jesus started handing out the fish and the bread. He never stopped till everybody was full and there were 12 baskets full remaining. Into the foodless place, Jesus brought food. And in his ministry, into the lifeless place, he would bring life. Into the dark places, he would bring light. All he needed was spit and mud to make blind people see. All he needed was water and no grapes to make the best wine at the party. And all he needed was a Lunchable to feed a multitude. This is the Savior we follow. Into our impossible situations. I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe you, Jesus. Like, I believe that that's you. Help my unbelief. Whatever is hopeless in your life right now, is it too hopeless for Jesus? Whoever is in your life right now that that seems impossible to reach, are they too far away to be reached 
wretched. That's how we say it, Appalachia. Are they too far away to be reached by Jesus? I made a friend this week. I didn't ask him if I could share this story, and so um, no names, no geography, but we got, with a, we got put in these pods of people, and we shared our, at the Harbor Network event I was at with these church planners, we shared our stories in the raw, man, raw. And he shared his story, one of just extreme racism against him, trouble with the law from childhood, falsely accused of an assault that he hadn't committed on the verge of a long time in prison, even though he's completely innocent, just because he had the wrong color skin. Eventually moves from where he's at out to, to L.A. God kind of rescues him from that situation. But he doesn't know God. He doesn't know it was God. He's in L.A. making beats. That's his job. No church. No Christian friends. Nobody who loves Jesus in his entire life. And he's making a beat for someone, and part of his creative process was he was kind of laying in quotes by uh, the doctor, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X, kind of in the background of this beat. And as he's doing that, God puts a question in his brain. Not anybody else. God does. Because Malcolm X followed Islam. Martin Luther King followed Christianity. And he started to ask himself, which one of these is right? And so he digs and he digs and he digs down a rabbit hole. And he gets to the place where he says to himself, it's the resurrection that makes the difference. If Jesus is really raised from the dead, then this is the answer. He still ain't talked to a soul. Never been in a church. So he starts to investigate the resurrection of Jesus. And God brings him to a place there in his like mixing studio in his little apartment where he comes to see that the resurrection of Jesus is true. And right there in that place, not knowing anything about it, he says, Jesus, I want to follow you. Right? The hand of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. The guy's planting churches now. God can save anybody. Isaiah 59, 1 again. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. We need a higher view of Jesus. In love, myself included, we need a higher view of Jesus. If Jesus doesn't appear larger than your problems today, please look again. If the impossible situations in your life today feel bigger than Jesus, please look at Him again. In love, I would say, And myself as well, guilty of the same thing. Jesus doesn't appear bigger than your problems today. You don't see the real Jesus. Look more closely. Jesus can save anybody. He saved me. He saved you, Christian. Let's live in thankfulness for that grace. Jesus can save anybody. Who's your one? Who's that one person that you're praying for that they're going to trust Jesus and and follow Him? Keep praying. Even a mustard seed worth of faith. And Jesus can use what you have, no matter how big or small what you have to offer might be, to accomplish what He has promised. What will you give Him? What will you give Him? To Jesus. Here's our homework for this week. I, I, really, what I would love for us to do is just pray every day. I believe. Please help my unbelief. My same friend that I met in Florida this week, he walking through another battle with infertility. Seven years. Him and his wife have been trying to have a, have a baby. 
no success. We were sharing our stories, and they were kind of having us do some different things that we would draw out. And, and for the end, they wanted us to draw a picture representing the future that we were hoping for. And I'm sitting here, man, and this guy's taking me all the way from, from like birth to like almost in prison to like, I mean, like I'm, follow, I'm invested in this guy's story by the time he, he gets to showing the picture for the future. But I'm sitting down the couch from it. He's kind of hiding the picture. But I saw it, corner of my eye. I started to weep because I knew he talked about the infertility, everything. And he turns that picture around, his hope for the future, and it's, it's a coffee mug. And on it, it says, world's greatest dad. He's grieved and hoped again, right? Though anyone who's ever struggled with infertility, you know, like month by month, grieve, hope, grieve, hope, grieve, hope, grieve, hope, seven years he still looks at Jesus and says, man, he's bigger than my problems. Jesus can save anybody. Jesus can do the impossible. I don't even have a point except for that today. I would love it if we would leave here believing that more than we believed it when we came in. Because I don't know what the application is in your life. I'm still trying to figure out what it is in my life. But what would change if we really believed that Jesus can do impossible things on our behalf? If you're not a Christian, Jesus did the impossible for you. The Bible is clear for all of sin fallen short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death. That's a separation from the loving presence of God. Instead of knowing God as Father, we can only know Him as wrathful, righteous judge. And there's nothing we can do to change it. God sent forth His Son, Jesus. Born of a virgin, 33 years of perfect life. No sin. Fully God, fully man. And He went to the cross and there... Nails into his hands, nails into his feet. Blood spills out and the blood of Jesus Christ, the greatest gift ever, cleanses us from all our sin by grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. If you're not a Christian, I would love to speak with you after the gathering about what that means and what that looks like. But you would get in on this today. Father, thank you that, that you do impossible things. And, and I know in this room some things that feel impossible right now for people. And there's a, uh, probably a, a multitude more things that I don't even know about. And I'm praying that you would give us faith to believe for the impossible. The timing might not be what we want. The answers might not come as quickly as we want. The road might be vastly difficult. But might we continue believing through the grief and the hope and the grief and the hope and the grief and the hope that you're bigger than anything we face in this life? And might that change how we live? Might it make us generous and and might it make us courageous? And it's particular when it comes to sharing our faith and inviting people to follow Jesus. Might that embolden us as well. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.